Mort Tort, 35, has been an increasingly successful lawyer for some ten years in Crime Town, USA. He has just become a junior partner in the firm of Will, Still, and Quill. This was a direct result of having married Jill Quill, the boss's unattractive daughter, some five years back. His young children, Hugh and Sue, are the apples of their grandparents' eyes. Like his in-laws, Mort Tort respectably attends the wealthy Episcopalian church every year at Christmas and his fashionable lodge every month. He always avoids discussing politics and religion because that is bad for business. Yet he is a very enthusiastic authority on the Dow Jones Industrial Average and on Catfish Hunter's Pitching Average because that is good for business. His Tenneco and Greyhound investments are doing quite well in spite of the nation's temporary economic recession and he's just moved into a brand new house in the choicest suburb of town complete with one wooded lot, two heated swimming pools, three Great Danes, four Chryslers, five color television sets and six large bedrooms. This is the life. John, or rather Mort, Mort Tort, has it made. Alice D., 19, is the spoilt son of an upper middle class businessman in Brashville, Tennessee. He has grown up listening to more television programs than he has to his parents, his teacher, or his preacher. He was bored by the time he was 10. But together with his peers, he discovered the excitement of drugs when he was 13. A whole new world opened up to Ellis. Here was his first authentic experience. His second authentic experience was being attacked and robbed while coming home from a movie when he was 14. His third authentic experience was stealing a car when 15. His fourth was running away from home and joining a commune when 16. His fifth was returning home and somehow finishing high school when 17. His sixth was his freshman year at college at his father's expense, making love and not war when 18. And now at the age of 19, Ellis D., is enjoying his seventh and consummate authentic experience. Having seen the meaninglessness of the rat race, he is now happily seated as a graduate dropout at the feet of his guru, the Maharaja Krishna. Ellis's quest for authenticity has now ended. Finally, he has arrived. Jack Black, 23, grew up in the slums of Harlem. He never knew his father, and his bossy mother nagged him incessantly. When 11, he got fired from his position as a newspaper vendor for withholding some of the profits from his boss. Since then, he drifted through a whole series of jobs, some worldly, but most underworldly. Predictably, the establishment ultimately apprehended Jack and attempted to rehabilitate him in the state penitentiary. There he read Martin Luther Queen, met Malcolm Y, and as a member of the Lumpen Proletariat was drafted into the Black Python Party, Marxist-Leninist, by his co-prisoner Eldridge Beaver. For the rest of his time in jail, Jack Black avidly digested the writings of Friedrich Engels, Che Guevara, and Mao Tse Tung. And when he is ultimately liberated from jail, Jack will liberate his brothers. Now, for the first time in his life, he clearly understands that liberation can only be achieved by sweeping away the oppressive environment of the United States and establishing the United Soviet States of America 
with Mississippi and Tennessee renamed Blackia as an autonomous Soviet Republic within the Union. At last, Jack Black has discovered the true meaning of life, and he will live and die to spread this good news far and wide. Now, ten years pass. By this time, Mort Tort is 45. He still has his suburban home with all of its luxury attachments, but his middle-aged wife is mostly involved with ladies' meetings and bridge parties. And so Mort himself is mostly involved with his beautiful young secretary at the office. His children, Hugh and Sue, are now teenagers. Sadly, they are already showing signs of going the same way LSD started to go some ten, day, ten years previously. Now, Mort still goes to his Episcopal church only once a year at Christmas time. But his real interests, of course, are, are now scattered between the office, the race course, and his golf clubs. He enjoys his cocktail each evening. And realizing the increasing emptiness of his life, he is now taking a correspondence course in Rosicrucianism, or rather Prosicrucianism, which he hopes will be useful in giving him a new interest in life. He gives a few hundred dollars each year to the Red Cross, which makes him feel real good. And he just sent off a small donation to the community chest. And yet... There is no central organizing principle in Mort Tort's life, and a sense of weariness and frustration is slowly but surely uh, creeping up on him. He knows that he should change, but change he cannot, for Mort Tort, middle-aged attorney, is enslaved to his own middle-class conventions. Meantime, LSD, now 29, has himself become a professional guru. He baths only once a month, not wishing to harm the microscopic little creatures that he believes adheres to his skin. He washes his long, uncombed hair only once a year, not wishing to harm the less microscopic creatures that even passers-by know inhabit his scalp. He writes flower power poetry when he gets the urge and encourages his admirers to drop out and to meditate every day. He has transcended the illusion of material prosperity and he believes himself to be a portion of the deity. And yet, deep down inside Ellis's heart, he knows that his life is a failure. As he considers the future years that stretch out so pointlessly ahead of him, he becomes aware of the fact that even life itself is phony and that only death is authentic. Increasing indifference to love and joy and health and happiness, our guru begins to long for death, for death as the final solution. And a further ten years of such an outlook on life will find him either de-guruized or dead, and if dead, then possibly so, by his own hand. Jack Black is now 33. After graduating from jail, he speedily rose to the position of precinct chief of the Black Python Party, and finally entered full-time service as first party secretary for the whole of New York State. His rise to this position, however, had not been without problems. His devotion to the party cost him his marriage, when his wife, Cleopatra, became a movie star. His belief in brotherhood was severely shaken when Brother Huey Newsstand and Brother Eldridge Beaver viciously denounced one another as right-wing deviationists and he became increasingly aware of the pragmatism of the Soviet Union and even of Red China as they both cooled off a great deal toward one another 
and both warmed up a great deal to the fascist United States of America, while, of course, negotiating big trade deals with their sworn capitalistic enemy. At times, Jack Black clearly sees that he, too, has betrayed the revolution, and that Marx's magic glitter of from each according to his ability to each according to his needs recedes more and more into the remote future, especially on the other side of the iron and bamboo curtains. Will the people ever be free? What then is the purpose of life as such? Now, we shall not paint a picture of Mort Tort and LSD and Jack Black in their old age. Indeed, we have no guarantee that any of them will ever live that long. But we shall categorically state that the older they get, the more frustrated they all become. And this is so because the lives of all three of them are out of kilter with reality. However, assuming that they, in their deepening distress, turn to the Lord with their whole heart, let us see what their new prospects will be as they progressively adopt the Christian outlook on life. As new Christians, Mort Tort, LSD, and Jack Black will experience the reality of the triune God. All three of them will know that it is God the Father who has created them, that it is God the Son who has saved them, and that it is God the Spirit who has turned them away from their sins and toward himself. Mort Tort will discover that God is more real to him than his search for business success had been. LSD will understand that God is more real to him uh, than was his own desire to be authentic. And Jack Black will find that God is more real to him than was the cause of all power to the people. From that point onward, Tort and D and Black may well doubt the reality of the various causes they previously lived for. They may even doubt the reality and meaning of their own existence. But they will never doubt the reality and the nearness and the relevance of Almighty God. All else may shake and tumble. Even they themselves may cease to breathe. But they know that the triune God will be there after Tort and his legal firm and D and his guru outfit and Black and his political party have all vanished from the face of the earth. Now a Christian life and worldview also acknowledges the sovereignty of God. And this means that Christians believe that God preordains everything that comes to pass and that he therefore rules the entire universe and controls all that happens in it, and that there is not a single inch of territory anywhere that should not be subjected to God's rule. Now, this means that God not only elected the lawyer, Mort Tort, to be saved at the age of 45, and the guru, LSD, to be saved at the age of 29, and the revolutionist Jack Black to be saved at the age of 33, but it also means that God preordained everything that Tort and D and Black ever did, even prior to their conversions, warts and all, and everything that they will ever do thereafter, laurels and all. It means further that God sovereignly ruled in Tort's self-aggrandizing legal firm, in D's God-dishonoring guru outfit, and in Black's blasphemous Black Python party, and that God used even these activities for which Tort and D and Black were, of course, themselves fully responsible. We say that God used even these activities to his own glory. It means that God sovereignly rules in a special way in the lives of his new children, Tort and D and Black, 
after their conversion, and that he has a particular purpose in all that they will ever do for him. And it also means that God sovereignly rules no less in a legal enterprise than he does in a religious group or than he does in a political party, irrespective of whether these activities are being conducted consciously to his glory as they should be or not. Christians also confess God as the creator of all things. Not only does the Lord create the church as his body, but more fundamentally, he also created the universe, the earth, the sea, the sky, and all that is in them. All things are subject to God's rule, be they grass and trees, or birds and bees, or dogs and fleas. All people are God's creatures, be they middle-class whites, outcast hippies, or Harlem blacks. And all professions are subject to God's rule, be they lawyers, or gurus, or revolutionists. Accordingly, Mort Tort will henceforth recognize God as the creator and the lord of the paper on which he drafts his legal documents. LSD will recognize God as the creator and lord of his previously uncut and unwashed hair. And Jack Black will recognize God as the creator and lord of the whites and of the middle class as well. The Christian outlook on life recognizes the moment-by-moment -moment dependence of all things upon God's providential care. Mortort could not have as much as moved his pen to draw up a legal contract but for the will of God, and neither could LSD have drawn one deep breath during his yoga exercises but for the will of God. Nor could Jack Black have uttered one single left-wing political slogan, but for the will of God. Wonderful it is to know that God upholds even those things he disapproves of, that God gives common grace even to the wicked to fulfill his own ends, that God is omnipresent in the lives and actions of all men, although, of course, subject to their own moral responsibility. For this reason, the now repentant Mort Tort, that is our attorney, can forgive the middle class for corrupting him with its own values. So too LSD can forgive his overindulgent parents for helping to make him into the brat that he became. And Jack Black can forgive those who made Harlem what it is for helping to make him what he was. But even more importantly, the new Tort and D and Black can also forgive themselves of their own past rebellion against God and against one another. For if God now be for them, who can be against them? And they can all look forward to a glorious future in law, and in religion and in politics to God's glory on account of God's providential care of them henceforth too. Next, Christians understand that God has given a great task to all men as a whole and to individual men in particular. For God told Adam as the father of the entire human race to be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and to have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God tells individual men today to do their own part in fulfilling this great task, and to encourage other differently gifted men to do their part in doing this too. Hence, Farmers are both to subdue the earth themselves and also to encourage sailors to subdue the sea and astronauts to subdue the air for Christ's sake. And more tort is to subdue the practice of law 
and to encourage LSD to subdue the exercise of religion and to encourage Jack Black to subdue the art of politics to the glory of God and for the benefit of man as the image of God. Further, a Christian life and world view is fully aware of the devastating impact of sin. For sin has stained the heavens and the earth and all of their contents. Consequently, the whole creation groans under its bondage. Now, this is not to say that all men are equally sinful, for they are not, and still less is this to argue that each man commits the same kind of sin as does his neighbor. But this is to say that sin has been written across the very fiber of creation. It is to say that all men are inherently sinful and that even the best works of the most idealistic men are only filthy rags before the Lord. Now, Mort Tort well knows that his previous claim to serve his client's interests was but a cloak to conceal his own uh, ambitions. Jack Black now confesses that his old motto of serving his downtrodden people and brethren was just an excuse to camouflage his own desire to wreck the God-given environment that he so hated. And even LSD now admits that his previous religious work as a guru was the acme of human pride in trying to fool himself that he was somewhat divine instead of casting himself as a lost sinner at the feet of a merciful Savior. Still more, Christians recognize that God gives common grace to all men, even to those who never get saved. Were this not the case, hell would indeed have been manifested here on earth right after the fall and forever since. It is only the common grace of God given in different measures to all men which restrains the full outbreak of every imaginable kind of sin in every man. Naturally, some men do have more common grace than other men do. The considerate Seneca, for example, obviously received far more common grace than did the maniac Nero. Winston Churchill was a much nicer man than Adolf Hitler. And uh, President Nixon of Watergate fame is obviously a far more pleasant person than the mass murderer Joseph Stalin. Moreover, each man receives his own special common grace gifts from Almighty God. Thus, Albert Einstein could probe the secrets of mathematics. Salvador Dali fascinates us by his arresting mastery of surrealistic art. And Vladimir Ashkenazi holds us spellbound through his God-given abilities to subdue the piano. So too, even the old Mort Tort, prior to his conversion, should be given full credit for his God-given legal abilities. The old LSD should be given marks for his God-given mystical insights. And the old Jack Black should be credited for his God-given political prowess, misapplied as all of these gifts of God undoubtedly were prior to the conversion of the recipients of these gifts. Now the Christian life and worldview insists that God gives special grace only to his children. For only those who believe in Jesus Christ shall be saved. Were it not for that special grace, even God's elect, totally depraved as they too are, would never desire to follow Jesus at all. It is only the special or the particular grace of God which regenerates and converts even Christians. And indeed, some Christians do receive more special grace than other Christians do. Some bear fruit thirtyfold, others sixtyfold, and yet others one hundredfold. And it is all and only on account of the grace of God. 
Obviously, Moses, the politician, was much more fruitful in God's service than was his brother Aaron, the preacher. So much for the heresy of so-called full-time service. Joshua, the soldier, was much more godly than the patriarch Judah. And Paul labored much more abundantly than all of the other apostles combined. So too, it is altogether possible that the new Jack Black may receive more special grace to become a Christian politician than the new Mort Tort to become a Christian lawyer or even the new LSD to become a Christian clergyman. God's gifts are pluriform. Not only does he bestow different characteristics on different minerals and plants and animals, but God also gives different abilities to different human individuals too. Furthermore, God endows individual families differently to the way he endows other individual families. The Rockefellers are given the gift of making money. The Edwardses were given the gift of rhetoric. The Strausses were given the gift of music. Jews are undeniably more successful businessmen than are American Indians on the whole. Welshmen are without doubt superior singers to Englishmen on the whole. Germans are unquestionably more thorough philosophers than Americans on the whole. Russians are incomparably better chess players than are Germans. And Chinese play ping pong far better than does any South African. Hence, Mort Tort accepts the fact that his political gifts are inferior to, to Jack Black's. Black agrees that his mindset is not as reflective as is LSD's. And LSD, in turn, admits that he himself just does not have Mort Tort's razor-sharp analytical mind of the lawyer. And in this way, you see, as God's children, instead of clashing with one another and stamping one another out, they all complement one another rather than compete against one another. Now, the Christian outlook on life makes very much of the work of Jesus Christ as the second Adam. In his earthly life, our Lord subdued the earth and the sea and the sky to the glory of his Father. In his death on the cross, he bore the penalty of man's breach of the comprehensive law of God for the sake of his children. In his resurrection, he demonstrated his power over all things in heaven and in earth. And at his ascension into heaven, as the Son of Man, he ascended the throne of the universe, whence he is even now subduing all things, and even all of his enemies, as a footstool under his feet. Realizing this, the Mort Torts and the LSDs and the Jack Blacks and all other Christians can rejoice in Christ's finished work and place themselves at his sovereign disposal. Accordingly, they can confidently exult in their Savior's victory and appropriate it as the basis of their own victorious life in all that they do to his glory as lawyers and preachers and politicians too. Now Christians are energized to serve the Lord Jesus through the power of the Holy Ghost. For after the Savior had ascended the throne of his Father, he poured out the gift of his Spirit into the church as his earthly body. And this outpoured Spirit now regenerates and converts and sanctifies all Christians everywhere in God's own good time. The Spirit regenerates lost sinners. He converts them by turning them away from sin as the transgression of the law, by turning them toward keeping the law of God as their reasonable religion in all that they do, particularly in that major part of their life when they're not in church. And this Spirit sanctifies his children by writing his own law more and more on the hearts of his regenerated children. And so we see Mort Tort no longer serves his middle-class conventions, but now he serves and has no other God 
but Jehovah. LSD no longer meditates seven days a week, but now he works hard in the sweat of his face for six days and rests on the Sabbath. And Jack Black no longer plots to kill the middle class and to steal their private property, but now he delights in promoting the welfare of all Americans and encouraging them all to serve God, work hard, and watch their very own possessions increase. The Christian view of life makes much of the church as the body of Christ. Accordingly, Christians love all of God's children everywhere. In spite of their differences, be they Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, or perhaps last and least, even Presbyterians. Further, Christians highly respect their elders as the kings who rule their churches, their preachers as the prophets who teach in their churches, and their deacons as the priests who serve in their churches. But most of all, Christians exalt their layman, number one office in the church of Christ, never forget it, the layman not the ministry or even the eldership. Christians exalt their layman as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Great as is the church in its corporate worship on Sunday, just as great must the Christian witness of all of its members be Monday through Saturday to outside of the church, out there in the world, not just as Christians who are businessmen or geologists or sportsmen, but also and specifically as Christian businessmen, as Christian geologists, as Christian sportsmen, which isn't the same as a Christian who is a sportsman. Hence, Mort Tort now sees his practice of law as a Christian calling and duty, and as the number one means whereby Christ would have him expand God's kingdom in the field of law. LSD now sees his duties as a religious leader to be a major part, the major part, perhaps, of his service to God. And Jack Black now correctly sees his new activities as a Christian politician to be the chief way in which he should be serving Jesus Christ as his Lord. Now, the life and world view of Christianity does not imply that one can never change one's vocation or profession. To the contrary, while each should stay in his present vocation until and unless God calls him elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 7, all Christians should endeavor to improve their positions even where this means changing their kind of job. If the Lord makes this possible and gives them a Christ-honoring desire to do this. Hence, Christian slaves in the first century A.D., were to become free men when given the opportunity. They were not to love their slavery more than becoming free. But they were not to grab their slavery when it wasn't offered them. Levites, like Moses, not to grab their freedom when it wasn't offered them. Levites, like Moses, are to become Christian statesmen accordingly as the Lord calls them to that high and holy office. Bachelors and spinsters are to enter into the high vocation of holy matrimony when the Savior calls upon them to do so. And it's awful difficult to tell you how that is, but you'll know when the time comes if you're not married yet. And our attorney, Mort Tort, and the Reverend Ellis D., our clergyman, and the Honorable Jack Black, our Christian politician, should constantly broaden their interests as the Lord gives them more light to follow him wherever he leads them, and so should we. Now Christians are committed to a trustworthy Bible as the first and the final court of appeal in all matters of life and conduct. Be they ecclesiastical matters, be they legal matters, be they political matters, be they any other matters. And because God himself has breathed into the pages of Scripture, as he has breathed into the pages of no other book or no other creature presently with us here and now on earth, because the Bible has been God-breathed, 
it is as infallible as is the God who caused it to be written. What the Bible says is what God says. Disobedience to the Bible is disobedience to the God who wrote it. Disobedience to the artistic and the geological teachings of the Bible is sinful even as is disobedience to the ecclesiastical teachings of the Bible. For the Bible is not just for church life, it is for all of life. The Bible may not be restricted only to the fields of worship or theological studies, important, vitally important as those fields are. This is not to say that the Bible tells us everything about everything, it doesn't. But this is to say that whatever the Bible does tell us about anything is to be believed. Hence, though the Bible is not a textbook or a handbook, not even for theology, it is indeed the number one source book for everything, and particularly for theology, not only for the Reverend D's clergyman's work, but also the number one source book for attorney Mort Tort's common law, as well as for the Honorable Jack Black's political program. The Bible itself teaches us that God also reveals himself outside of the Bible in nature, in our conscience, and in history, and to that I would like to add in man's culture, in man's changing of nature as he comes into contact with it. Of course, this does not mean that we can ever interpret nature or culture, or our consciences, or history, without the aid of the Bible, because we can't. All of these various revelations of the will of God have been stained by sin, except the Bible. The Bible alone does not lie under the curse of God, and so, Scripture must interpret nature and culture, and never the other way round. And yet, Nature and culture and conscience and history do, to some extent, reveal the will of God too. Hence, the Christian geologist, armed with scripture, must next proceed to interpret the rocks of nature. The Christian psychologist, steeped in the Bible, must next evaluate the human conscience. The Christian historian, steeped in the Bible, must next analyze historical documents that he finds outside of the Bible. The Christian artist, armed with the Bible, must next analyze the world of culture that he finds outside of the Bible in the light of the Bible. For in thy light we see the light. And so, attorney Mort Tort not only brings the biblical law to bear on United States law, but he also thoroughly studies U.S. law itself, if he really does love the United States. If he doesn't, and if he just sits with his Bible all day long and spouts that in the courtroom, instead of, in addition to that, what the uh, American statute law says, he's neither a good lawyer nor a good Christian, and still less a Christian lawyer. Reverend LSD now a missionary in Bongo Bongo land, not only brings the biblical message of salvation to bear on the heathen Bongo Bongo religion, but he also thoroughly studies Bongo Bongo traditions. If he doesn't do the latter, he is not a good missionary nor a good Christian. And the Honorable Jack Black, now congressman for Harlem, not only studies the teachings of scripture about politics, but he also thoroughly studies the political situation in Harlem, too, as it really is. And if he doesn't do that, the latter, he doesn't really love his constituency. Throughout then, these men are not to adapt the Bible to their situations, but they are indeed to make the Bible relevant to their situations. The Bible is not just a guidepost to show you how to get to heaven, it is also... It's even primarily, if you read it from cover to cover, a guidepost to Christian life here and now in this present concrete world. Now the Christian outlook on life promotes the kingdom of God above all other things. This kingdom of God is all-embracing. God's kingdom is not restricted to the life of the institutional church. Scripture teaches us that God's kingdom is over all, over all of art, 
over all of science, over all of literature, over all of geology, over all of mathematics, over all of sport, over all of housework, over all of high finance, over all of education, over all of everything. Hence, the Savior's prayer, Thy kingdom come, includes Thy kingdom come in my legal practice for attorney Mort Tort. It includes Thy kingdom come in my church affairs for the Reverend LSD. It includes Thy kingdom come in my politics for the Honorable Jack Black. However, the Christian knows that the kingdom only comes in part prior to the second coming of our Lord. Great though our progress must be to proclaim Christ as the King, the King of art, the King of science, the King of literature, the King of the church, the King of the state. Yet, when we have done all that we can, there is still so much, so much, that disfigures even the works of our own only partially sanctified hands. For not only do we so easily see the faults of other Christians, but they can even more easily see the shortcomings in our own works for the Master. Hence, our attorney needs compassion in evaluating the sin-stained work of that well-intending enthusiast, Reverend LSD. And the Honorable Jack Black needs compassion in evaluating the value of the legal work of our middle-class attorney, Mort Tort. Uh, while Mort Tort, in his turn, should not forget Jack Black's ghetto background, which continues to haunt him uh, quite a bit, even after his conversion to Christianity. Throughout then, let the brethren above all love one another, for love shall cover a multitude of sins. Now Christians are to be future-oriented people. It is God's business and not a Christian's business as to when Christ will return to wind up history. But it is the Christian's business, however, to exercise diligent stewardship for the Master as ruler over his Lord's household. Hence, the Christian geologist must classify his rocks to the glory of God. The Christian wife must obey her husband for Christ's sake. Christian parents are to raise and to train their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And Mort Tort and LSD and Jack Black should confidently promote, respectively, the practice of law and the preaching of God's word and the construction of a Christian politics to please the Lord and for the benefit of all future generations until Jesus comes. Christians are on their way to heaven. And when they die, they know that they shall ever be with the Lord. But precisely because the Lord will then reward every one of them according to his works, our works here and now must be done thoroughly. Hence, we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God in order to become thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The good work of loving our wives and our children the good work of laboring in a godly profession to the glory of God, the good works of saving our money and multiplying our talents, and last and by no means least, the good works of saving souls. For whether we eat or drink or do anything, we are to do it all only to the glory of God. And when Mark Tart and LSD and Jack Black die in the Lord and go to heaven, why, their works that they've been doing on earth do follow them, even their professional works, in the respective fields of law and preaching and politics. Last, Christians, promises Jesus, shall inherit the earth. Not only shall they expand their control over our earth here and now, for Christ's sake, but they shall also come back to this same earth and none other, after its renewal by fire on the last day. And then the glory and honor of the nations of them that are saved shall be brought into the new Jerusalem, we're told on the last page of Scripture. This international glory and honor of the nations that we will inherit forever on the new earth to come will include the music of Germany, the art of Italy, 
the industry of the United States, and the fruit of the legal work of Attorney Tort, the church work of Reverend D., the political work of the Honorable Black, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In conclusion, how should we apply this Christian outlook and life in practice? By means of preaching, witnessing, tracts, pamphlets, books, newspaper items, radio broadcasts, movies and television programs, but above all, by living it out in our natural lives every day, all of us, and our laymen in particular, must proclaim in word and in deed, first, that the triune God is not dead, but very much alive, for it is clear that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Second, that the triune God is sovereign and controls all that comes to pass, for known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Third, that God created all people and all things, for all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Fourth, that in everything we are to be dependent upon God's providential care who upholds all things by the word of his power. Fifth, that God requires all men everywhere, according to their several gifts, to subdue the earth and the sea and the sky to his glory. For thou hast made man to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Sixth, that sin has stained all things and all people. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now. Seventh, that God gives at least a measure of common grace to all people. For Christ is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Eighth, that God gives special grace only to his elect, for all men have not faith. Ninth, that God gives different abilities to different people. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Again, that Christ's finished work is the basis of the Christian's victory, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Further, that Christ's Holy Spirit now imbues Christians with the power to live to the glory of God for if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Christian church, moreover, decently organized, is to perform a central role in the expansion of God's kingdom. For Christ gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor-teachers for the perfecting of the saints, till we all come unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and may grow up in him in all things. Lest some of you think I've been too hard on the preachers in downgrading their role, let me say immediately, I think if we get some decent preachers in every pulpit of America, uh, and they'll preach the whole counsel of God, which has hardly been done at all at the moment, then God's people will wake up. So I indict the preachers, and what's more, that is a very crucial area. So if the Lord calls you to be a preacher, you go, b preacher, you go be a preacher, provided you've got the gifts and know how to preach, and don't just goggle on the pulpit. Further, all professional jobs are Christian vocations, so that all Christians should regard themselves as being in full-time service of the Lord. For as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. Further, that the Bible is the only infallible word of God and is needed to enlighten us as to our duties in every field of human endeavor. 
For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God for instruction, so that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, not just unto all good church works, but unto all good works outside of the church too. That nature too is to be studied, inasmuch as the living God made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are therein. That the kingdom of God is not to be restricted to church activities, but is indeed all-embracing, for his kingdom ruleth over all. That even our best works for God here and now are only fragmentary, for we know in part and prophesy in part. That we are to be confident about the future prosperity of Christ's kingdom here and now in this present earth. As Dr. Brown said, we're in pre-Christian America, not in post-Christian America, for Jesus must reign until he hath put all his enemies under his feet, and he shall have dominion also from sea to sea, from the Pacific to the Atlantic, and from the rivers unto the ends of the earth. That the works of Christians here and now bear fruit for all eternity, both in heaven after their death and on the new earth to come after Christ's second coming. For blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, and their works do follow them, and the kings of the, of the earth do bring the glory and the honor of the nations into the heavenly city. And that the great commission of our Lord Jesus requires his children not only to turn all nations into his disciples, and that's exactly what the Greek says, Matetusate panta ta ethna. Don't turn that to read little handfuls of Christians from each nation. This isn't what it says. Go and turn all nations into Christians. That's what Jesus says. And then having done that, we're to teach them all things that Christ has ever revealed. Everything about law and religion and politics and art and literature and economics and everything else. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, make all nations into my disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things. That then is just a brief outline of the Christian view of life. A view that the triune God, in whose name his children have been baptized, is to be served in all things whatsoever he has ever commanded us to do. Is this your endeavor to serve God in this way? The lectures that you have just heard were produced by the Christian Studies Center in Memphis, Tennessee at one of the recent Christian Studies Center Institutes held each year during the month of June. Permission for distribution of these recorded messages and lectures of the Christian Studies Center is through the Mount Olive Presbyterian Church Tape Library at Bassfield, Mississippi. Should you desire further information regarding the work of the Christian Studies Center or additional tape messages of previous institutes or lecture series, write the Christian Studies Center, Post Office Box 17122, Memphis, Tennessee, 38117. That is, Post Office Box 17122, Memphis, Tennessee, 38117.